Okay, so let's transition to the uh, uh, to the keynote. And so it's my pleasure to to introduce the keynote. Um, uh, Oriel Vinyals is a principal scientist at Google um, uh, at Google DeepMind. And hang on a second. Uh, uh, he's team lead of the deep, deep Learning Group. His work focuses on uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, prior to joining DeepMind, Oriel was part of the Google Brain Team. Uh, he is yet another of our alumni that we are proud of. He received his MS from our department in 2009. As I guess Soren would say, woohoo um, for us. Um, he went on to get his PhD in, e e uh, in ECS from the University of California, Berkeley, and is a recipient of the 2016 MIT TR35 Innovator Award. I should also point out that we actually overlapped uh, because he got his undergrad at UPC, uh, and, and during that time I was actually there on, uh, on sabbatical. Um, his research has been featured multiple times at the New York Times, Financial Times, Wired, BBC, etc. Uh, his articles have been cited over 100,000 times. Uh, some, of his, some of his contributions, uh, 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 such as sequence to sequence, knowledge distillation, or TensorFlow are used in Google Translate, text-to-speech, uh, uh, and speech recognition, serving billions of queries every day. Uh, he, was the he was also the lead researcher of the AlphaStar project, creating an agent that created a top professional, that defeated a top professional at the game of StarCraft, achieving grandmaster level, and, uh, and this was also featured on the cover of Nature. And um, I don't know why I get the feeling that that last thing uh, about StarCraft is the thing that got everybody's attention here. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's my great pleasure to introduce our uh, keynote speaker, uh, uh, Oriol Vinyals. And, and, and again, uh, feel free to, to queue up questions for after the talk uh, on, on chat, and I will relay them to Oriol. Um, uh, great. Thank you so much, Dean, for this wonderful introduction. And again, uh, joining all the congratulatory to, uh, congratulations messages for uh, both um, Daryl and, and Jeff. Um, it's a great piece of advice, I agree. So let me share my screen. And I wanted to share a bit of perhaps um, a path we, which I'll interleave both from a personal perspective, but of course, um, hopefully, it will also serve as uh, maybe perhaps a, a turbo introduction to, to machine learning and uh, also sequence modeling in particular, which um, is a very sort of active topic of research, uh, and not, not only research, but indeed um, of applications in, in, in the current world we live in. Um, so I titled my, my, my talk sort of A Road Towards the Chain Rule, you'll see why in a second, but it could also have been titled something like A Love Story with, with Sequences. And, um, and, you know, it's hard to start a talk in 2021, I mean, it's, it's past 2020 without talking first about indeed the challenges that um, we've probably all witnessed and gone through. Uh, certainly it hasn't been um, a very easy last few months for, for many of us, um, so I hope, you know, all of you are coping with the situation um, quite all right. And, um, but indeed silver linings such as me being currently, I'm in, in London, being able to give, uh, give a talk, give, give a sort of a perspective talk onto um, machine learning, sequence modeling, et cetera, is, is great. Uh, but indeed I actually do miss uh, now more than ever perhaps uh, a bit of the, the San Diego vibe and, and the nature and, and the, you know, reliving some of the great memories that uh, I had during, I, I must say, uh, maybe too short of a stay uh, during 2008, 2009, but um, it's, it's truly an honor to be giving this keynote today. And so I'm, I'm a fairly visual person. I, I draw this just kind of as a as a almost reflective uh, self reflection uh, a slide uh, very personal obviously onto more or less kind of steps i took along the way some sometimes it felt very random right so maybe most of you could imagine where you were doing what you were doing um, you know for 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 the past few years and oftentimes it's hard to sort of uh, connect the dots i i got that sentence from a from a great um speech from from steve jobs actually so it usually happens that only later you, you look back and you realize sort of the impact that uh, moments uh, or decisions uh, have had in your life. And certainly by preparing this talk, um, I look at 
you know, I went to the, the sort of the memory, the memory train, and I, I recovered some interesting emails that I was uh, sending uh, around when I was in, in San Diego. And this one is, is definitely one that inspires really a lot of the research that I've been lucky to be part of. Um, at the time, Roger was a professor at UCSD working on um, linguistics, and I always try to apply machine learning to everything, including language. And this was perhaps what got me to know that I was going to be stuck in, in language and sequence modeling for quite a while. This quite a while is, is still present today, uh, but it's very beautiful to see from, from you know, looking back in the past where, where kind of where the origin of or the inception of some of the research uh, threads happened. And indeed, it's very nice to connect this to UCSD in particular, um, although, of course, many other moments are critical right in one's, in one's decisions. Now, inspired by all the pictures we've seen, I'll, I'll just show you just one picture of me, uh, my only attempt at actually surfing, uh, which is in, I think this is in one of the, the beaches, uh, you know, close to campus. I never succeeded at it and I, I stopped doing that, um, especially not in the cold weather of London um, or like UK, I guess. Um, and then last but not least, uh, this opportunity to give this talk have actually incidentally reconnected me with, with Roger. I, I just tweeted just hours ago actually about how excited I was to be here. And actually, Roger, I just kind of replied to, to the tweet and, and said, um, you were quite a student. I'm not sure what that means exactly coming from, from a linguist, but hopefully it, it means somewhat good things. Uh, but you know, I, I guess I'll have a chat with Roger at some point soon. So let's get into more of the technical details or, or a, a bit of this journey uh, through the chain rules, I must say. These, these two principles that, that changed my research and, and indeed changed the way in which we do machine learning in 2020 and beyond, right? So this is kind of the most maybe basic con concentrated slide that I think is quite useful for those who actually actively research or use machine learning, but also for those who might not know exactly what it is about. And in here, I depict essentially the four main ingredients that I still have yet to find a, a model or, or a paradigm in machine learning that does not fit these four components, which is the data, the model, the laws, and the optimization procedure to learn the model. And these four components, indeed, um, you can do many, many things, the most basic of which Perhaps you've, if you've heard about one, you might have heard of supervised learning, which is the task of essentially trying to map uh, an X, which could be an image, right? So, so an array of pixels onto a decision or a probability distribution over what is in the image, a cat or a dog being very simplistic, of course. And um, then what defines essentially deep learning, which is the subfield perhaps that I, I, I identify with the most, is that this function parameterized by some parameters data has the form of a deep neural network, uh, which has many layers of computation and it's a very powerful nonlinear function approximation. And then you, know, you define a loss that you might want to optimize over a training set and you optimize these parameters and you end up with a model that you can deploy at scale. And I mean, every one of us is probably influenced by, by a model, at least one model um, or more nowadays. There's many references and tutorials. That's, that's about you know, as, as short of an introduction uh, to machine learning as I can give. But in here, the first chain rule, that's the, not the one I'm going to talk too much about today, um, appears clearly, which is you know, if you take or you remember your, your calculus classes, right, the, the chain rule uh, the, of, the, of derivatives right, um, is very useful and actually created backpropagation, one of the most uh, cited papers in computer science, I believe, actually, that defines how to compute gradients of that nonlinear, many-layered function, thanks to the simple you know, uh, realization that uh, many layers of computation, which are essentially matrix multiplications plus nonlinearities, um, can be described as a composition of functions. And as such, we can compute what's called a forward pass to compute the output. That's what you would do essentially to get an image classified. But also in the backward pass, you compute the gradients of all the parameters of these little neurons, how they, inter they interconnect with each other. And so funnily enough, there's a 
the first change rule we find very early if you learn about neural networks or machine learning really um, of any kind of a co function composition and this this is kind of a fun, a fun coincidence that they're called the same but the topic of of interest today is that of modeling sequences um so just mapping it to this maybe useful um, for categorization um, sequence modeling is essentially almost the same as supervised learning except that in general you don't need a target you don't need a label um, all you're doing though is modeling not only a single variable but a sequence of random variables words being the most common um, way to think about this and how I'll kind of explain you a bit why this is such a hard problem because and ultimately obviously we as researchers are, are driven by the hardest problems that we can get our hands on and sequence modeling certainly felt very hard at the time and it still feels very hard for for many reasons that I hope I can convey a little bit in the next few slides. So with this in mind let's maybe use language indeed as the driving motivation for explaining a bit why modeling the probability over arbitrary sequences of words let's say is quite a challenge and also indeed quite useful so let's let's imagine right that i i state modeling word probabilities is really difficult and um, and you want to take a probabilistic approach to this before entering into details about models right so so the most naive thing you can do and it certainly has been done um multiple times is to just apply um, a very simple rule which is look the probability of a sentence is essentially the product of probabilities of each individual word in the sentence right that very simplistic view is reasonable is a first um, approximation to what we're getting to and indeed you could do that by simply counting from some corpus of data how many times you know the word modeling appears with respect to all the words that you have in the corpus the word the word word the word probabilities the word is etc cetera, etc cetera, and multiply these probabilities right so in a way you're decomposing this joint probability of this very complex object this multi-dimensional um, very com combinatorial object into this simple decomposition of very simple task right just the probability of a single word and obviously that has um, extreme uh, limitations as a model and um, for instance the most likely six word sentence um, according to this model most likely since d is such a popular word would be just the word d repeated as many times um, as you want to kind of go for let's say which is a not a very satisfactory model to produce language that looks natural but that's the most likely sequence right that that's that's kind of obvious in hindsight perhaps so this independent assumption really does not match of course the sequential structure of language now the second chain rule enters and it's beautiful and it's simple um, and it says that you can essentially write down any probability distribution over these complex multi-dimensional object which would be sequences of words you can decompose it as the product of these probabilities um, factorized as follows right so what you can write instead of writing probability of the first word times probability of the second word etc as, as in the previous slide all you have to do to be able to express any model right the, there's basically a, a, a an equivalence right from the left to the right uh, hand side here that's what makes this quite a powerful principle is that all you have to do is model the probability of the second word given or condition on the first word times the probability of the third word condition on the first two words etc cetera, etc cetera. and this 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 multiplication happens to be able to express any complicated complicated probability distribution over words which is sort of the first object of interest in in language modeling and that is great that that does not require any approximation but naively thought about is actually quite challenging for a, a scalability and sparsity issue right so imagine let's say okay let's that's that's it i'm going to model uh, word sequences like with the chain rule um, so all, all I have to do now is count words. Now, instead of counting individual words, I need to count pairs of words, right? So how many times the word word appears after the word modeling and you build, you know, your small matrix matrix of, of words um, following other words. You count these based on some large corpus of data and you hope that's going to be 
quite quite good, right? And it, indeed, it's it's a, a reasonable approach. Now the problem is there are many words um, in English, for instance, and so this matrix ends up looking very sort of it gets out of control very quickly, and this is only considering pairs of words, right? In reality, what you will need to consider is essentially sequences of all lengths, right? Because you you might get a very long sequence, you might want to model a whole book, right? So this is a multi kind of faceted matrix almost of counts that gets very out of control very quickly. Um, and of course it grows roughly um, as vocabulary times uh, power to the end. So it's exponential. And that creates a huge pressure to, um, to sort of get this object in your hands in a reasonable way that is data efficient as we call it in machine learning. So the most obvious simplification and indeed the one that probably was the, the, the state of the art, especially when uh, at the time I started uh, working on, this, on these topics back in 2008 or, or so, is just essentially saying, look, let's assume for the sake of assuming that we don't need to condition on all the previous words. You need only a limited memory, right? You assume that, look, to predict the word difficult, really all I need to look at is the last two words, not all the words that came before these, but the last two words are sufficient. Now that's not as a, a harsh approximation as to say the word difficult without any context is all I need, right? It is, this extends a bit the sort of the chain rule a little bit, but it truncates essentially the, the to, to, in this case, a history size of two. That's what we call n-gram model when in general for n, um, but, Again, it's not the most satisfactory uh, thing to do. And for n relatively large, it also gets out of control very quickly. So um, Google has had, or I hope this website still exists, but in 2006, actually, Google released in DBDs, I, I believe it was like something like a few DBDs. It released this matrix, basically. The matrix of all n grams, um, I believe of size five, right? So five grams in English that, were counted from the web at the time, right? 2006 obviously feels and is ages ago. And even only counting five word sequences that appear at least 40 times, so really disregarding a lot of data already from this, you get a humongous number of five word sequences. So this becomes out of hand and five words of context is, is quite, quite a small amount of context to assume this independence, which is a fairly harsh assumption. If you think of the talk I'm giving, you know, potentially you would believe that what I'm saying depends not only on the last four words. So this clearly is not an approach that was kind of gonna solve the problem of modeling language. So this is the key insight, right? This is what essentially changed the field slowly through papers, through, through people um, sort of playing initially with maybe toy data sets, small data sets, but eventually nowadays, this is the way to model sequences. And perhaps it's not the ultimate way, but certainly the one that dominates. And it's a very simple insight that combines a little bit of this machine learning or deep learning or this function or model into kind of for rescuing a bit of the, the essence of the chain rule. So remember the chain rule is about, well, we need to essentially model the probability of the word at position t, condition on all the words one, two, up to t minus one. And this is this matrix that gets out of control. The key insight here is, can we somehow encode all the context in a way that is not, does not require us to count, but rather we just map all these contexts, all this, these complicated sequences of words up to the time, um, at, at the present time or the present position, we encode that with a nonlinear function um, that will map the context onto a single vector h. And the, the, the point here is ideally you would want this h to be in vertical, right? So essentially, if you can find a, a unique mapping, which of course, if, if h um, or sorry, this function is reasonably complex, you will be able to map um, unique sequences of words to a single vector of numbers, right? This, this h is literally you know, 128, 256 dimensional continuous vector. That's kind of the whole point of neural networks is to transform any data into these continuous activations as they're called, mimicking a bit um, activations in the brain. And then that sort of um, a vectorization of the context is the key insight that is driving all um, the sequence models these days. So 
that's great. And then the field, essentially the, the deep learning, machine learning field, NLP, actually natural language processing field has sort of now been shuffling ideas or, or, or you know, sort of iterating over what should this function, you know, what, what should this function be? Um, there are certain desirable properties that we can identify certainly for the function, right? So for instance, an obvious one is that we would like this function to be um, sensitive, sensitive to order. So if I swap or permute two words, um, I should get a different vector, right? Otherwise, um, this is just a back of words, which is actually one powerful model that is used oftentimes in, in the community. But we wouldn't want that to be a property, right? Order has to matter. This function ideally should be able to deal with variable lengths. The context we encode is essentially all the words up to T. And this might be only two words, or this might be half a book that you need to encode into this H vector, right? To compress all that you've seen into that one um, set of numbers, right? Now, critically, we want this function to be somewhat smooth, ideally differentiable. So we can then just apply a loss and optimize this function to do the task that we want to do in language modeling, for instance, which is maximize the probability of predicting the word that comes next after the sequence of words. And you know, we want this function to be quite nonlinear. We know meaning um, is quite tricky to convey in language. So changing a single word um, could change dramatically the meaning of a sentence. And indeed, this function cannot be very smooth. It needs to drastically change if you add a, neg a negation or something like that, right? So that's kind of a, a desirable property of this function. And last but not least, it should sort of have sensitivity to the whole history of words, right? It's kind of a compressing function, but it would be a pity that um, a sentence that I said right at the beginning of, of, of this talk is forgotten, right? You might have compressed it a little bit and simplified it, but it might certainly become relevant as you formulate uh, your own thoughts or questions perhaps, right? So these are desirable properties. And then what's been quite fun to, to see, and maybe at the time I started sort of to look at in the field, uh, you know, from the class, um, you know, recurrent neural networks were the model of choice. Um, and then, you know, the field move, move forward um, and I'm not gonna enter into much details, but as I said, um, sequence modeling has advanced quite a bit and LSTMs, which actually were a model uh, proposed back in the 90s, became sort of the model of choice because they were able to preserve long-term. And in fact, this stands from long, long short-term memory. So um, this was a model that sort of got a lot of popularity, drove Google Translate and many other services out there that dealt with generating language. Um, but then perhaps the one bit that was missing, which was this powerful encoding of words and any pair of words sort of being connected to some extent was introduced thanks to something that I call the attention principle, which is the only sort of more into neural networks slide that I have for you. But hopefully it does make sense. It's a fairly simple method that if you know or remember a bit of linear algebra it would be easy to understand. So let's see, let's, let's assume that we're dealing with translating, right? So we have a bunch of uh, Chinese characters and then it's corresponding translation. And we've managed to encode these symbols, right? The words or the characters into embeddings or vectors of let's say 128 dimensions, right? These embeddings, by the way, generally are simply a lookup table that this is a matrix that is indexed by the word. And then you pick the column in the matrix that has 128 learnable parameters corresponding to that character or that word. Um, which is a fascinating idea that, that actually preceded a bit of sequence modeling. Um, and if you are curious about that, that's called word to back or word embeddings. Beautiful um, for those who are interested in, in language and interpretation of vector spaces and, and words. Now, going back to these, let's assume that we've managed to encode these sequences, right? Both an input sequence in this case, this is a translation task and the output sequence. All you have to do in this attention principle, right? A recurrent neural network and a long short-term uh, LSTM um, recurrent neural network would essentially encode these words into this 128 dimensional vector and sort of write its own memory, rewrite it every time it receives a new word, it rewrites slightly these 128 numbers and it creates sort of a memory that is cumulative, so to speak, right? It's almost you write to memory continuously. That's essentially how most recurrent neural networks work. 
But this attention principle says, wait a second, let me treat this sequence of words almost as a memory bank that I can read from. And that's a very powerful insight, in fact. And all you have to do is you have a few what we call keys. Keys are things that we key that we search, right? So, and then there's queries, right? So let's say at this point, I want to look for what word comes next in the translation. And I know the answer probably is in, you know, is in, in these characters, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to query through issuing a 128 dimensional vector um, that you will then dot product. So that's, that's the magic, right? You have 128 dimensional vector over here, a few 128 dimensional vectors over here. And all you're doing is a dot product that gives a single scalar for each of these connections, right? So these would be one number, this would be another number, this would be another number, and so on and so forth. This number then is essentially normalized to be positive and to sum up to one, right? So you just apply some nonlinearity to make this kind of almost a soft read, right? So I want to know how much I want to read from this input sequence. Um, and in this case, maybe you read from more strongly from these, the word number four and word number uh, or character number four or character number five. And then you might, again, read from, the, the, you know that you pay attention, that's why it's called attention principle, to these two words that might contain relevant information to decide what's the next word. And then you can assign values as well. So there's a key query and a value system that the values you read from based on these intensities. And you can do all sorts of interesting things with this uh, attention principle. And the critical bit here is that the, this memory that you build as you read more and more words is variable sort of size, right? The more you read, the more keys you would have, and you would be able to access or poke into them as if it was really a computer memory. The magic is all this is differentiable. And all you're trying to do is maximize the probability of predicting the next word by adapting all these mechanisms that map these, these words or symbols onto these vectors, right? And that is the magic of neural networks. You define sort of a very powerful, but very um, initialized, very randomly, really, um, mechanism that in principle can do what we do when we do translate text. text and then we give it a lot of data and then this mechanism sort of adapts to do the right thing. And it's amazing to see the success and the implications of, of these kinds of models, some of which I'll, I'll exemplify in a little bit, but I hope this attention principle at least intuitively, you know, it's fine. And then that is as a researcher, most of what you do is just kind of look for sort of inductive biases as we call them, just principles that would be generic almost from computing actually. So this is, as you can see, is a bit of a soft read from, from memory. And then we have this idea that we make everything differentiable or as differentiable as we can. And then we just let sort of the chain rule, not of probability in this case, but the chain rule to compute gradients and to then adapt these, these little mechanisms to do the right thing, which we cannot express in a program, right? That's why some people call this software 2.0 or soft, software 3.0 is that you no longer know how to express translating from Chinese to English, um, but you can just write sort of this program that then through the, the supervised learning in this case will optimize the parameters to do the right thing. So very powerful principle, as you can see, I mean, this has been like, I am, I'm in love with this sort of research, the problem that it possesses and so on, um, but then, this architecture, that's kind of the current sort of state of the art. It was actually um, published reasonably recently, although this field moves quite fast. So it feels like ages ago, but in 2017, this variant of a recurrent neural network was proposed called the transformer. Um, it really transformed a little bit how we model language and it actually ticked kind of all the boxes, uh, but you know, is this the last inception of a model to model language? Probably not. The field, as I said, is advancing quite quickly. So let me now just tell you a bit, a bit what has happened, right? These, these, all these advances usually are obviously supported over metrics, um, evaluations, uh, products, etc., right? And perhaps the, again, still using language as the driving force, I'll tell you a bit what, you know, what pure language modeling um, where, where it comes from a little bit. And, and if, if you've heard um, these amazing results coming from OpenAI, I'll, I'll just tell you a bit what GPT is, which now you almost know because the principles are actually rather simple. 
But taking a little bit of a look at language modeling, right? The, the work of language modeling is say, okay, I can model these complex objects, which is distribution of, over English, let's say, sentences. And what I want to do now is just sample from it, right? I want to see what are likely sequences under my model, under all my assumptions. And in fact, if you read um, some of the very old papers from, from Shannon, you'll see that he describes a process for, for n grams or three gram models um, in, in the case of the, that I'm showing here of how to sample, how to make these models sort of hallucinate outputs, right? That under the model look plausible, right? So you're just simply um, asking the model now that you've trained on all the data, please just get me the next word given what you've produced so far and keep going until you, know, you produce maybe end, end of, 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 of sentence or a, a dot or whatever. And a sample coming from these very old models, uh, n-gram models that I described, looks kind of locally plausible, but indeed, if you read this, it's just not good, right? So you can see here Mexico and Brazil, which sure, it probably occurs a few times, but then you can sort of see, even though this is probably from a data set that, that is about economy, I guess there's a lot of uh, numbers and dollars and so on. This just makes absolutely no sense. Um, and you have to almost think there are windows of three words that make sense. But if you go beyond three words, this just doesn't feel, feel right. Yet this was kind of, as I said, state of the art up to 2010 or so. 2010 to 2000. 15 or 16 saw an explosion of these models um, and neural nets became the, the driving force, this vectorization of the context that I mentioned became critical. And so what I'm showing you here is samples from papers that um, you know, were published. This one is, is one of the first that certainly caught my attention. And in here, if you read, you can kind of see that it, it sort of starts to make a bit more longer term sense, but it, it's still far from any, you know, it's far from believing that this would be, have, could plausible, plausibly have been written by a human, right? It, it's, it wouldn't pass any sort of Turing test at all, neither of these two. Um, in 2016, now with these better models that um, capture a bit better the longer term um, correlations of, of words, and train off on more data, I must say, uh, these models start to look reasonably well, right? This, I mean, this looks noticeably better um, with even more new technologies coming onto the market quickly during the past three years. An increasing number of companies now must tackle the ever-changing and ever-changing, okay, not great, environmental ch challenges online. I mean, this is the sentence that the model hallucinates, kind of starts to look better clearly than, you know, a few years ago. And, at this point is where I also start sort of playing with the idea of, of generating language um, myself. We had a few, a few papers on both machine translation, but the one that maybe I wanted to bring to your attention is um, this model that we call a neural conversational model um, that I, I bring to your attention just because maybe some of you are using you know, parts of the research we did back in you know, 2014, 15, um, as Google essentially then launched, you know, a simplified version that helps you compose email faster. And I certainly have used this, this method myself a few times when I have to reply something quickly. Um, and, you know, one of the beautiful things is these models, and in fact, why the industry um, has become quite an active player, even in research, right, um, is that, well, you can actually use these models in production to help people, let's say, type faster answers. And certainly this is one of the main applications that you know, are used quite a lot. And a few years later, this was actually launched as a smart reply. There's, there's a, nice a nice blog post explaining a bit, you know, slightly differences. It's not as pure as just generate any answer. Um, certainly productionizing machine learning models is in itself a very challenging thing that I only know a bit by experience. My job is mostly kind of more on the research side, but it's beautiful to see how, how these models then um, can be put into production as well, uh, which, is, which is quite, quite fascinating, um, especially if you work in these research labs in industry. Now, here are some samples from that early model where you kind of see that these models start to sort of somehow compress knowledge, generic knowledge into their weights so you can, poke the model by basically asking something like, who is a Skywalker? 
and then you let the model generate the most likely words and you know he says he's a hero right so it's it's this is trained on movie subtitles it's kind of a fun exercise we did back in 2015 but what happened with the transformer is that a qualitative jump happened just because of this better architecture and jointly with more data right so if we go now to 2018 2019 most of, if not all of the research now is dominated by this new architecture, same principles, new architecture. And if you look, this is the prompt, right? So in this case, this is trained over Wikipedia articles and you, you wanna generate an article that whose, which title is Wings Over Kansas. And then the model sort of generates word after word uh, telling you that you know this is a feature film uh, written and directed by this person. I don't know if this person exists or, but this is certainly a plausible name, I guess. Um, and you know, it just starts rambling about what these wings over Kansas um, Wikipedia article might be about. And even further, uh, in the now quite um, quite well recognized GPT two model that was GPT two, so slightly earlier than GPT three. Um, OpenAI demonstrated this incredible coherence in language generated from these very bizarre, almost uh, looking sample, like initial seeds, right? So in red, you, you force the model to condition, right, on these few words. And then again, you, you generate one word after the other. And if you read these passages, if you haven't seen these, take your time in terms of researching over, over GPT if you're interested, but it's quite unbelievable the qualitative jump from, from those earlier models, even the 2016 models in the span of two years, more data and better modeling that we achieved um, as a community. So that's quite fun to see really. And you know, on the note, on, 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 on scale, I must say that you know, these early movie subtitles data set we used to, to, in 2015 had 900 million words or tokens, right? So that's, that's a fairly large data set. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, a, thousand, a thousand million English words of, of data, right? That you can train to understand what plausible uh, sequences or, or, or English language might look like. But then you see kind of this explosion that GPT-2, which was published in 2019, had a corpus based on web level or web scale data set of 40 billion and GPT-3, which again provided even another qualitative jump in terms of how good these models became. Um, it's an order of magnitude larger, right? 500 billion words uh, mined from you know, the web, right? So that's, that's quite an impressive achievement, even just from data storage and other things that you obviously also might love a lot about computer science, right? So just storing these, these data, collecting these data is an undertaking in itself. And then the modeling advances also very remarkable to in combination create these exceptional language models that understand so well the structure of language. And so that only cannot be sufficient, right? These are trained on also lots of hardware and very large models are trained uh, on these billions of words. So for instance, GPT-3 has trained 175 billion parameters, right? That's 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 humongous number. Of course, nowhere near the, the amount of neurons that, that we have on average, right, in, in our brain, but it starts to be also very large to sort of deal with this computational. And these, these parameters, all they're doing is this matrix multiplication, generating the keys, the queries, how to attend to the past, to predict the future, et cetera. Right? It's, it's, it's a beautiful, simple principle, but powerful, especially when paired with this amount of data and this amount of hardware to then iterate, keep computing gradients, keep updating your parameters, right? It's, it's quite unbelievable how simple principles have gotten us so far into very impressive, really, performance of these language models. So to conclude the sort of pure language modeling um, section, I'll just kind of leave you with, with a bit of, of the imagination of the public that was given access to this model that essentially you could give it any text and then you could keep generating text from it, right? So um, we have all sorts of bizarre things going on um, from someone from the Guardian sort of using these language models to write this whole article. So you can, you can go ahead and read this article that is, is generated with some caveats, of course, but it's mostly generated by this language model. And then very excitingly, I find this fascinating. You can do things like, um, for instance, let's look at this one. You can enter an equation in text. And because people in the internet 
ask all sorts of questions to one another, you can essentially, without any training or extra training, just try to map some sort of complex language combining some math to actually the LaTeX compilable form. Um, or you can also write some sort of like, oh, I want to generate a website that looks like this and that. And then you get HTML code that you can then render and it looks like the website you are intending or you kind of the ugliest emoji ever and you get some sort of emoji that the model generates, right? So it's, it's quite unbelievable how putting these tools um, to, to, to then to be used at scale enabled all sorts of interesting applications um, and the end is nowhere in sight. I mean, people are still experimenting with these. And again, I suggest you, you do a bit of research if you're interested into this. Um, and I find this kind of maybe the most interesting result in the last two years or so is that by training a simple model that predicts the next word, you actually enable this, this assistant that does quite a few things for you, uh, which is really quite fascinating. Cool. Now let's switch gears just to give you a bit of breath onto how the chain rule and sequence modeling um, has played a role in actually playing games. I call this playing with words, and you'll see in a second why. Um, so this is, again, switching gears into not super supervised learning, but reinforcement learning, which, again, can be mapped into these data model laws and optimization. The main difference in reinforcement learning is that the data does not come from a frozen data set of all sentences or all the web or, or whatnot. It comes from sort of an environment which could be a computer game. And in general, it has been um, used a lot for research purposes. And this computer game essentially gives you observations that you see on the screen. You then click a button or use the mouse to select something. That is an action that is given back to the game. And this loop sort of completes this reinforcement learning cycle. Now, I'm not going to go too much into RL. Obviously, there's no time for that. But let me just show you how these dots that seem maybe possibly disconnected map into kind of sequences. Again, my, my personal love story, perhaps, right? So um, we decided to work on a fairly complex game that I actually used to play as well called StarCraft. And you don't have to know anything about the game other than the actions, right? The kind of outputs you need to generate to issue instructions to the game are fairly complex. Essentially, you have a few units, and these units have spells, and these are spells, there's many of them, and you want to cast a spell into some point in the map or to another unit. So it's a fairly complex sort of combinatorial space of actions that you can do at any given time in the, in the game, right? So for instance, here, we are um, doing a force field, which is this thing that blocks units from passing through here. So this is a defensive move. And you know, who is doing these are these seven units, right, that are selected. So here the, the player would have selected this unit and then say, build a, a force field on the ramp. And then this player will decide to wait for a, a few milliseconds if they're really good and really fast, and then issue another action to the game. That's how you play and interact with the game. And if you want to build an agent that plays this game well, you must deal with this very complex action space. But this action space is, and it truly is an API to a program. And we work with Blizzard on these, and they expose their API. And an API is just a different form of language. So really, to solve this problem, I'm showing here the whole architecture, but really, the way the chain rule appears is this equation, which is to decide or to build an action at every time step that you need to think to, to, to do something onto the game you're going to essentially use the chain rule to decide, OK, I'm going to decide what am I going to do? That's the first word. It's a special word that conveys this API the game provides to you. And then given what action you decided, you're going to decide how long are you going to wait um, until the next action? And then you decide, am I going to queue this action? And am I going to do it right now? Who is going to do this action? That's a selection mechanism um, that is actually based on the attention principle. Um, cool enough. So there's a few components here. It's almost like a puzzle that you have these all these ingredients of learnable components, and you're putting them together to now be able to play a game, right? Which is very cool, and that's kind of the power of machine learning. And last but not least, you might decide where are you gonna issue this action, and these plus many other things enabled something incredible, which is almost like you generate a language 
so to speak. But this language now is converted into API calls onto the game. And here you see an agent that does, I mean, if you know the game, it does like kind of the right things. It builds units, it moves its camera around to, to look around you know, in the map, it creates a new building, it might engage the enemy, it might move its own units, try to, try to manage it, it builds a new building here. It's quite incredible to see. It's almost like magic, almost like you're generating a language, but in this case, it's a language to play the game. And it's, you can see this principle is more general than for language only, right? This is an API to a program that now suddenly the same principles apply. And I think that's what's so beautiful about machine learning is you might zoom in into one application, but then you can zoom out and apply it elsewhere. And then last but not least, this is more future looking, um, it happened very recently, um, is and apl applications beyond uh, games that at least at DeepMind we start looking into more seriously. Um, and I'm just gonna briefly describe what's the role maybe of sequences in, in what, um, what has been sort of regarded as a breakthrough in protein folding. So very quickly, and myself, I am not an expert of these. That's also the beauty of machine learning. You get to sort of try to attack a problem from as an outsider by looking at the data more than understanding maybe the core principles of what's going on. But, and probably this year more than ever, um, modeling the components that make um, everything that lives in us, including viruses, sadly, um, is essential to life. And the job of protein folding essentially is to convert this signature that is actually literally text. Um, I think it has 23, um, 23 characters. It's not a lot of words in this case, but you, your job is to convert um, these sequences of uh, amino acids onto how will they then conform spatially speaking, because then you might understand how you build puzzles, how, wh why certain proteins atta uh, you know, attach to, to other elements or other parts of your body, we heard a lot about spike proteins lately, as I said, very sadly, but this is a very important problem that takes quite a, lot, a long time and quite a lot of effort to actually, in a lab, figure out what is the actual structure of proteins that appear that are new and we haven't categorized yet. Um, so as I said, this has tremendous applications um, from understanding diseases, creating drugs, or even synthesizing proteins to do certain, to attach to certain things. And Again, mapping it to this actually is very simple, like supervised learning. Um, this is a problem where you have a sequence which happens to be this bizarre language, right? That is that is the language of, of perhaps like, phys like physics, chemistry, and nature. Um, so these sequence of amino, amino acids are, are what conform the proteins. This is your input. And then your output is for each of these characters where where are they in, in 3D space, right? So that's, that's what protein folding really is about. And very luckily, there's a very nice uh, data set that has been collected um, for, for years now. And the, the approach was to try to figure out this mapping, right? So minimize the loss, like very simple, like very, very, very simple approach, really. Um, and if we zoom in into what alpha fold really is, um, you start seeing this beautiful connection to language because a lot of the components, again, thinking of components that were used to try to map this sequence of characters in a, in, in a sequence to this 3D structure that obviously has a lot of interesting correlations, spatially speaking, not things that are close by um, in the sequence means they're gonna be close by necessarily, right? When they fold. So it turns out that these attention principles, these all these beautiful things we mostly explore through language, well, they happen to actually be quite critical, a critical component to make performance of these models work better than you would have expected. And in fact, um, amazingly, in, in, you know, there's been a competition going on every two years that, that you know, has kind of uh, proposed new proteins to be folded. And then you have a phase where you submit your proposals and then you evaluate essentially how far you are from the ground truth. And we had a system in 2018 that actually performed quite much better than the competition. And it actually was slightly different than supervised learning. But just by uh, using these components and just obviously iterating over the process of doing machine learning, tuning your models, all these things that we love to do, we managed to actually reach 
about above 90 GDT, which is regarding almost like solving the protein folding problem. And again, I mean, if you're interested, there's a lot of material out there, but it's quite incredible, these kind of connections that you can form between fields that superficially might look quite far apart, right? And this is just an example of um, the protein that is folded versus the ground truth. And as you can see, I mean, these things look complex, but they overlap quite a lot, right? The GDT of these would be 90. There's some mistakes and so on, but it's actually quite incredible. Um, and it's a very powerful tool, right? In fact, we actually, um, as, as soon as the protein, um, for, for instance, COVID was, was sequenced, right? Sequencing, getting these, these character sequences is relatively inexpensive. We released for the public to, to look at the structure that was predicted by the system before, of course, a lab, which is, had very high interest to obviously find what the actual folding of the protein looks like in reality, um, provided the ground truth, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a very nice accelerant. I find this story fascinating. So I guess keep an eye on this. To conclude, I mean, I love sequences. What can I say? Uh, thanks, uh, especially to, to those um, who inspired uh, many people to work on this problem. In my case, I mean, that email from Roger really was probably what I can see as one of the critical detonants, and, and that was during my time as, at UCSD. I still think language is, is, is by, by far not soft, um, and I really like this view that we can also use this kind of technology not to only write English, but also write programs, right? So that would be an interesting uh, thing to do to just maybe try to write a program from our language models. That's something I'm currently uh, researching a bit with some folks um, over at, at DeepMind. And last but not least, I would say keep an eye because science is a very exciting domain for disruptions from machine learning. And again, either you yourself are interested or if, if, you, if you just wanna look for very like nice applications of, of machine learning, keep an eye for this because I think AlphaFold was really probably only the beginning. So with that, I think I see the chat has some questions, so we can have maybe 10 or so minutes of questions. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, and again, like super happy to be here and reestablishing this connection with uh, UCSD. Thank you so much. Uh, Oriel, that was great, thanks. Everybody, please uh, join me at least virtually in, um, in, in thanking Oriel for, for, for a great talk and, and, and all those insights. Um, we already have some questions queued up and uh, Feel free to put a few more on. Um, so let me just start with the first one, which is from uh, from, from Shayak Ben Islam. How is the uh, the attention mechanism or attention principle related to the idea of the neural Turing machine? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question. I mean, obviously, um, we could. This talk was trying to convey a bit of like an overview of of the field, uh, and it's it's indeed been a very active field, but. Um, there was a very beautiful paper from DeepMind, actually, from colleagues of mine that proposed this, this be, be, like, beautiful concept I was alluding to when I said that, look, this attention mechanism is a bit like a memory that you would be able to endow your model with. And that's actually um, present as well in the neural Turing machine, right? So neural Turing machine um, proposed not only a mechanism to read from memory, right? That would be what I described, but also write to memory. And it basically suggested that there is such a thing as a neural network that is a Turing machine or it emulates a Turing machine, but with everything being differentiable. And I think that line of research is very exciting indeed, but it's, it's as related as the mechanism is, is present in that paper as well. There's a very nice link, thanks. Great, thanks. Um, next question from, from Rose Yu. Uh, what would you suggest to students uh, in terms of research directions who maybe don't have access to massive computational resources uh, uh, such as uh, someone would within Google? Yeah, th that's that's an excellent question. I, I get this question a few times. I, I, I don't answer always the same way. It depends, I guess, how, how I feel. But there's always a component to the answer, which is um, sometimes being somewhat in a unique position that is not what the mainstream position for many researchers is, right? So there, obviously the research, like industry has a, a very large amount of researchers. We all happen to have fairly large amounts of compute at our disposal. So the way we think about research actually gets influenced um, by that. And there's a bit of group thinking, which is both good and bad. Good because we talk to each other, we collaborate a lot and, 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 and we create advances, but it's also bad because Sometimes constraints are what 
create what is needed that those who don't have certain constraints don't see it. And in fact, today, one of the things that I describe and possibly the most critical and innovative piece of research that I described to you came from a lab that was in Montreal. So the attention mechanism was done to actually um, sort of bridge the gap of not having such a vast amount of compute because in these 128 dimensional vectors I mentioned, what we actually did at Google is have an 8,000 dimensional vector. And that enabled us to, to translate languages quite well. But at Montreal, they didn't have so many GPUs. And then they actually have to come up with the attention mechanism that creatively breaks this bottleneck of a single vector to distributed vectors. And that, that breakthrough, I mean, look, at, look now, I mean, the influence that had was incredible. And because we just had the GPUs, we just use 8,000 as a hyperparameter instead of 1,000, which is what they were doing. I mean, 1,000 is still large, but, um, but that actually is a beautiful story. And so attention mechanisms came actually from, from academia. And likewise, I mean, there's many more examples, but I think one, one way to reply is use it as, 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 as a tool, actually, as, as an asset for you. Another one, obviously, is we, we need to realize hardware is needed. So, you know, try to talk to people in your department that perhaps we need to spend a bit money on like cloud or buying GPUs or whatnot, right? That's also quite, quite critical. Um, and maybe hopefully we from industry can also help as much as providing free credits and so on. So that for that, I mean, try to try to keep asking this question, please. Great question. Okay, so uh, here's another question that comes from uh, from from Tanmay Lad in the in the chat. What are other problems in biology that are being tackled at DeepMind? So, yeah, I mean, I think the the list I I put with um, with AlphaFold that's kind of I mean we're really still unpacking because it was very crazy. I mean, in fact, the competition happened during the pandemic, so. It was very fun to be part of the team, um, kind of pushing for like oh, better architectures and submitting. Um, so it's it's still it feels very recent that the results were announced. Um, and so I think at least from the AlphaFold standpoint, what we're really trying to do now is to write as nice piece of research as we can uh, for for the community to enjoy um, reading not only the report that we submit when you submit to the competition. So we're quite busy actually still with kind of. Wrapping, wrapping up the first phase, which is protein folding. Um, but beyond, I think the, the, the maybe perhaps, um, you know, drug design um, comes to mind as quite relevant nowadays, but, but also an obvious choice, even, you know, without knowing that our current world is quite influenced by, you know, medical applications first, perhaps. We, all of us uh, are thinking a bit, a bit more about that, that domain, for sure. Okay. Another question from Rose, um, back on the massive computation um, yeah. theme, is what's your view on the carbon footprint and the environmental impact from training really large models? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I mean, I sometimes map the, the I mean, the, the large, the large compute clusters that you know, big companies such as Amazon, indeed, um, AWS or or Google or or Facebook or Apple or like you know, or, or, and so on have. And I map that a little bit, although it's not a very exact mapping to um, CERN, right? So, so CERN is this kind of unique hardware piece, right? That that if you're you're a physicist, you you kind of almost um, have to use, right? To to test some of your hypotheses, right? So, but with that comes responsibility too. Like it's a resource, it's it's finite, and so anytime you do an experiment to test an hypothesis, it has a cost, and so you have to really be careful about the kinds of experiments you design for that particular hardware. Um, now, I mean, maybe there's, we're trying to obviously like as much as possible, like have um, people from academia to have access to these resources. Um, obviously paying is one way, but ideally we also try to give grants, but on the carbon footprint itself, I'm like, look, Myself, I mean, I, I currently don't have a car, although I did have a car in San Diego. I think without a car in San Diego, I'm not sure like you can do much. But in London, I mean, I don't have a car, but I sometimes see this mapping right between oh, training these these language models is is equivalent to like let's say seven cars, right? And one way to think about it, perhaps more positively, is like well, seven cars is a lot of carbon, but a better language model that let's say improves hopefully um, 
more than obviously it's a change but it's more of an improvement than anything improves google search i mean what's the value of that i mean what's the value of seven cars compared to that because the beautiful part here is that the training itself is expensive but then the deployment um, is quite cheap right once the once the weights are trained then you can essentially give this model for everyone to use relatively speaking very efficiently from an energy standpoint um, of course, like sometimes you there's failed experiments and, and if you think of carbon footprint cumulatively it's quite large, but I'm quite positive overall that um, that if I think especially because training and inference have such different costs, um, the benefits certainly outweigh the, the, the risks. Obviously, large companies such as Google try to remain carbon uh, neutral. That's not to say that we should just use it as if it was no consequence as researchers, right? So it's a, it's a complex topic. I, I'd love to follow up on that. But yeah, those are kind of my initial thoughts, right? That um, that I think benefits hopefully outweigh risk and we always evaluate that, of course. And as a community, we should report these numbers and, and I see an increase actually in number of papers that um, look at this as, as a research, you know, as a research paradigm that appears because of the huge scale in which things have happened right in the past. So that's great. That's a great question though. All right, thanks. Uh, so let me just echo all the comments in the, the chat to just uh, thank you for an amazing talk. Uh, that was great, really interesting. And we really appreciate you uh, taking the time to, 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 to join us and, and give us your insight. Uh, so just, uh, you know, uh, in, in whatever way you can, again, let's-, let's uh, thank, thank you so much, yeah. Yeah, thanks everyone. I mean, it's it's a bit bizarre to be alone uh, giving a talk, but but um, it really is is it's been a very special one. So um, reach out I, either in the chat, private, or or you know social media, etc. If you have follow up thoughts, I, I would love to hear um, more of these excellent questions. But yeah, thanks for the invitation. Otherwise, yep, great. Okay, so everybody, um, there's lots of stuff to do today. Um, for for a lot of you, you you've got time for lunch. For others, you, you you've got reunions. Uh, but please, you know, you know, check in back, especially for the research area sessions and the poster session. And so have a great day. Connect with some people, um, you know, send messages, set up meetings, uh, all those things. And uh, I will be seeing you uh, uh, hopefully throughout the day. So uh, have a great afternoon. And thanks for coming. Mm -hmm.